I believe one of the greatest teachers that God uses is suffering. I don't understand it. I don't like it. But it is a fact of life. This life will have problems. That will have pain and there is suffering. So I want to ask you to not just go through this message just in the mind. That's part of it. We'll go through the PowerPoint. But I'm asking you in your heart to really let the Spirit of God speak into your life, into your heart. Maybe in ways you've never even thought of. Maybe even, even in ways you don't even want the Lord to. But I'm praying that maybe some of us through this message will find a, an entire new level of hope in our lives. Tonight, I want to talk about suffering. Have you ever asked God, like I have, why? Why Typhoon Ondoy in Manila two years ago? We were here for that. We had to leave. Why terrorism in New York City and innocent people die? Why does my friend's little baby girl die at the age of one from cancer? Why, God, why so much suffering? I don't have many answers, but I at least want to try tonight to share from my personal life journey some of the things God has allowed me to go through, what I've learned, but I'm still learning. And maybe some things tonight can possibly apply to you and your life journey as well. So let's turn to the book of Job. The book of Job. This book here of Job, it balances out a lot of the out-of-context teaching that we see all over the world through television and radio. I'm all for God's blessings. I'm all for the abundant life. However, if that's all I focus on is nothing but the blessings of what God can give me, then I'm going to have to rip the book of Job out of the Bible <laughs> because it brings all things into perspective. We have to take the Bible in full context. If not, that is how problems begin. That's how cults start. That's how churches split. Sometimes when we do not study the Bible in the full context. Now, I'm not a Bible expert. I'm not a scholar. I don't understand Greek and Hebrew. So I'm going to just give you a topic tonight and share from my life the steps of healing through the suffering God allows in our life. And let's open to Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. Job 1 verse 1. And the land of Uz. I didn't even know. I forgot how to pronounce that name. So I asked my friend, Dunda, how do you pronounce that? Uz? Uz? How do you say that? I don't know. But that would be a nice place to live in. I live in Ooze, Philippines. <laughs> I live in Ooze, Texas. But anyway, Job in the land of Ooze, Ooze, there was a man, his name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. Verse 2. He had seven sons and three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys. And he had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. That's quite a resume. He was the greatest Christian man leader in the entire land at that time. And let's jump down now to verse 8. Job 1 verse 8. The Bible says, Have you noticed my servant Job? He is the finest man in all the earth. A man of complete 
integrity. That's the second time the Bible is giving high words of praise to this man of God, Job. And that verse there, 8, starts with these words. And I think this is so funny. Then the Lord said to Satan, Imagine that. God is talking to the devil. They're having a conversation. If I was in the same room with the devil, I wouldn't talk to the devil. I would punch him and kick him. I get mad at the devil. He does some bad stuff to me and to you. But God's talking to the devil. Isn't that curious? That just fascinates me. And let's read some more verses. Job 1.14 says, While he was speaking, a messenger came. Verse 16, what's it say? Another messenger came. What's verse 17 then say in Job chapter 1? While he was speaking, another messenger came. Job 1.18, the next verse says, while he was speaking, another messenger came. Within a matter of minutes, many messengers came to Job and gave him these words of what has happened. Verse 13 through 15, all his animals and farm hands died. Verse 16, the sheep and the shepherd died. Verse 17, Camels and servants died. And the worst of all, verse 18 says, Job's seven sons and three daughters all died. They were killed in a tragedy like a tornado or something. We really don't know. But those of you who are parents, if one of your children died, it would just totally break your heart, wouldn't it? I have no children. But I can just imagine the pain you would feel. Now imagine ten children all at once lost their lives. What would you do? Job lost all his money, all his resources, all of his material things, all ten children, all that was left was his wife. Someone once said, any man of God can lose everything, but he cannot lose his wife. <laughs> However, Job's wife, even at times, she disappointed him and said some things that were not encouraging. But God let her live to be there with Job during this horrible, horrible time that he went through. Now this is what really is a mystery to me. Job was innocent. Now, was he sinless? No. But he was trying to follow God with all of his heart, man of integrity. He was standing up for God's kingdom. So all these tragedies happened to him. It wasn't his fault, but God allowed them to happen. I don't know why God allows tragedies to come upon us, but I do know this. The book of James tells us God does not do the evil to us. God did not personally do this to Job. He allowed the circumstances. God does not send typhoons to the Philippines because He loves the Filipinos. But in some mysterious way, circumstances at times come together where these mysterious tragedies happen. Now this text of Scripture also lets us know of the power of the devil. He was able to inflict Job and hurt Job. The devil was allowed to work through circumstances and destroy all these things in Job's life. Because Job was disobedient? No. Because Job was obedient. He suffered because he was following Jesus with all of his life. And that's what I would like to ask you. I know you're following God with all your heart, right? If you are, why does God allow these mysterious sufferings to come upon us? Are there any possible reasons and explanations for these things? 
I think there are. At least a few of them that I hope can apply to our lives tonight. The first thing that I believe the Bible teaches and that I've learned from applied to my life is that suffering builds our faith. Suffering builds intimacy with God. I have some dear friends who are married, husband and a wife, in Christ. They're totally on with Jesus. But they've gone through horrible, horrible things. And they've told me that during these trials, their relationship as husband and wife, built on Christ, became more and more rich and intimate. The suffering built intimacy in their marriage. It's the same in our relationship with Jesus Christ. If we choose to allow Him to be master and Lord over the suffering, we can become closer to Jesus Christ in the midst of these painful times. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews 5.8, Although He, Jesus, was a son, He learned... He, Jesus, the Son of God, He learned from the things which He suffered. Did He suffer because Jesus had sinned? Jesus never sinned. He was innocent, yet He suffered. Ultimately, on the cross. What is God teaching you through your suffering? What lessons is He trying to reveal to us through the pains in life. There is a reason for it. God loves you. Not one hair on your head. Not one ounce of inside your body. Not one wind, one storm, or one typhoon can touch you in Christ unless God mysteriously allows it. And we always know in Christ if we're fully dedicated to Him. Every single pain has a purpose. So please know that. What is God trying to incorporate? What ingredient is God adding? What area is the Lord purifying in our life with Jesus Christ? through our suffering. Number two, suffering also is a tool God will allow to move our life forward. God may shake us to move our life forward. An example from the Bible, Acts chapter 8. The church was very, very comfortable in Jerusalem. And what happened? God allowed persecution and suffering to come. And the Bible teaches us that then the church scattered. And the result, they grew. More people came to know Christ. I can tell you that I am, as a human being, even on subconscious levels, I like to be comfortable. No one really likes change. And because God may say, I want you to go here, and we go there and stay there for months or maybe years or maybe decades, we can become very settled in our place. And God tries to get our attention, but we keep missing God. So what may He do? He may allow some suffering to come and shake us, get our attention, and then He says, I have something different for you now. So sometimes suffering is to get our attention. Is God trying to get your attention tonight? If He is, I guarantee you this. It may hurt for now, but God may be trying to wake you up or wake me up to move us out into a whole new level, a whole new chapter of life and ministry. But first, He's got to shake us out of where we're at to get us over here. And sometimes that hurts. Is God shaking you recently? What's He trying to reveal to you through the pain you may be currently going through? Also, the Bible can tell us that suffering breaks us. 
Let's look at Job chapter 1 verse 20. Job fell to the ground before God. Let's remember the context. Job lost ten children, his business, his position. He lost everything he had. He was a very, very strong, humble man of God. But these circumstances broke him emotionally and psychologically. Job fell to the ground. A broken man, not knowing what to do except say, God, please help me. He had reached the end of his rope. Have you heard that before? We say that in the States. I'm at the end of my rope, God. There's no more room to go. God, you put me in a corner. I can't run anymore. I fall to the ground, Lord. What are you breaking me for? What are you trying to break in me? the suffering. In my life, I had areas that I had not surrendered to Christ yet that I wasn't even conscious of. I hid them away subconsciously. The mind can do that. That's what brokenness does. God can break, crack us open and when He cracks us, what comes out is issues we've never faced before. Pains we've tried to run from. Doors we ignore. God may allow circumstances and life to break us. Are you being broken lately? Why? What is God preparing you for? What's going on inside your brokenness? Or you're really focusing on it and saying, Lord Jesus, what is the purpose for the brokenness I'm currently going through? Sometimes it's a control issue. All of us as human beings, we like to be in control. Are you trying to control things too much in your life? Am I fighting God for control of my life, of my ministry, of my money? of my children, of my husband or wife? Is God trying to get you to loosen the grip and pry your fingers open so that He can break you and then have greater control which ultimately leads to more liberty, more fruit for the kingdom, more power, more satisfaction. So God breaks us. Also, suffering at times is our fault. At times, suffering is my fault. I'm a human being. I make mistakes all the time. I have sinned against God. Especially many years ago before I really knew Christ, I made sinful decisions that had consequences. So if there's someone here tonight, even though you love Jesus Christ, here's an example. If you were out doing drugs, if you were out having sex out of marriage to people you're not married with, or if there's someone tonight who's committing adultery, you will have suffering, but it's your fault. That's unnecessary suffering. God didn't force you to be a cheater. The devil didn't force you to be a cheater. We make a choice to sin. So sometimes suffering is unnecessary, but it's my fault. And I have to face the natural consequences of making dis uh, decisions that are sinful. But my friends this evening, perhaps you're struggling and you have a big secret inside. A big sin that's just eating up your conscience. Come to the cross. Repent of that. Ask Christ to forgive you. Rededicate your life. Find someone to be accountable for the secret sins. And you'll become free. And your life will go in a whole new direction. If you really rededicate yourself to the Lord. So suffering at times is my fault. But also suffering at times is not 
our fault. Job is an example. He did not have any big sin patterns. He was trying to obey God, yet he suffered greatly. I sometimes read stories on the internet or on the news that makes me angry and cry. Such as in India, when children are forced into child prostitution. Or when I see all these beautiful babies in the Philippines who are walking around very hungry and have their parents have no money. That, that bothers my heart. I want to help them. That's not their fault. Maybe something has happened to you and you're suffering because of something that wasn't your fault. Sometimes we really are innocent. Sometimes innocent people suffer because this world we live in is fallen. It's corrupt. It's broken. When I was a small boy, 11 years old, I was just a young paper boy working to deliver papers to the neighbor's homes. Two men out of my family who were on my paper, my paper job, they made friends with me. And I became friends with them. I liked them. But as time went by, they were just being sneaky. And what they did was eventually they began to use sex to abuse me through sexual abuse. I was scared. I was confused. I was a small boy. It wasn't my fault. I had no one to cry out to. They threatened to kill me if I told anyone. So I couldn't cry for help. So I kept all this secret deep inside my heart and hid away. I pushed it out of my mind. It was too painful to think about. Boy, well, years went by and eventually we moved away. The abuse went on for quite some time. But then we did move to a different part of America. As a young man, I became very angry and depressed and used drugs and alcohol trying to take this pain out of me. But it didn't help. But when I did accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, Lord, and God, not only did Jesus Christ forgive my sins, but Jesus Christ began to heal me from the sins other people did to me. So my precious brothers and sisters in Christ, has someone hurt you? Has sometimes been suffering in you, not your life? And it wasn't your fault? Maybe as a boy or a girl, your parents left you. Maybe like me, someone abused you. Maybe even today, there's suffering going on and it was not your fault. Please hear me. There is hope for you. If we really and truly relinquish control of this suffering to Jesus Christ, He has the power to go in and become Lord of this suffering and somehow change it around even into something good like abuse or undoing. God can somehow turn these ugly things around and make them into a beautiful masterpiece. And my scars are no longer deep, ugly, infected wounds. They heal. And they become scars that I can then use to connect with other people. Whatever you're going through that wasn't your fault, God will use it to help other people. When I was 27, I began recovering from issues from my past. For 15 years, I know that's hard to believe, but for 15 years, I was in recovery and healing from having a violent alcoholic father, having parents who divorced, and then most of all, the sexual abuse. All that did something to my mind, what they call post-traumatic stress. 
So for 15 years, I was trying to just survive. I was already an evangelist. I loved the Lord. I was trying to be pure and innocent and repent of my sins. But man, I was suffering through some horrible times. I thought I was going to commit suicide. I said, Lord, I can't do this. I cannot go anymore, Lord. Please, you have to either heal me or take me to heaven. I can't go anymore. But Lord, the God, but God, He was quiet. He's silent. I said, have you left me? Do you not love me? And the months turned into years. I tried on faithfully following the Lord. But he was still pretty quiet. But I knew he was there. I've learned that when God is most quiet, that may be when he's there in the most secure way. Sometimes when he's quiet, that may be his answer. He's just there with you. You don't need to hear anything. You just have him because he's there with you in the silence. So if you're hurting today from things that were not your fault, what are you doing with that? Are you running from it? Or are you facing it and saying, Lord, I'm not going to run. I accept these things. They were my fault. But I now take responsibility to work through the circumstances from the suffering that was not my fault. It's not fair, but it's just the way it is. So you may have to find a good friend or a Christian counselor or a strong, honest church leader. Don't go to a gossiper. Go to someone confidentially. Confidentially that you trust and share these parts of your life with. And you will be amazed how much it helps us to heal and grow from these parts of our life. The next thing, suffering can bring real trauma. Job 2.13, let's read this. Then they, those are friends of Job who came to try to help him. Then they sat on the ground with him, Job, for seven days and nights, one whole week. And no one said a word for one week. There was not one word spoken. For they saw that his suffering was too great for words. Wow. Have you ever been around someone who was in extreme, extreme pain and trauma? What happened to Job because of the loss of his children? He went into shock. Post-traumatic stress. That's what I believe. I mean, think of that. For one week, he was on the ground in shock. He's like, he was just staring into space. He couldn't believe what had happened. Like, Ondoy came through. Do you think there were some people after that typhoon who lost loved ones, who were in shock, just walking around, not knowing who they were or what was going on? There can be trauma in suffering. And no one said a word. I can tell you, when I was at the very most painful part of my life, which, is a, which was around 12 to 10 years ago, I was hurting so bad. I was so mad at God. There were times I couldn't even read the Bible. And if Christians tried to say, Scott, Praise the Lord you're hurting. Praise God you were sexually abused. I wanted to just hit him and say, You're a fool. But you just stop trying to help me. Your help actually hurts. Job's friends were there and they saw him and realized he was hurting so deeply they did not say a word for one week. And then sadly... When they began to speak, they weren't helpful. They tried too hard to help him. They over-spiritualized things sometimes. That's why it seems that during this time of extreme, extreme pain and trauma, 
We need to just be there in the presence of someone. We don't necessarily have to give them 20 Bible verses and 20 hallelujahs. It's okay to say, it's okay to say my friend, I don't understand what you're going through. I'm here for you to listen, to love you. How can I help you? You don't have to fix them. There's a time and place for wise counsel. There's a time and place to give scriptures. But sometimes unsolicited, unwanted advice does not help. It can slow down the healing process. Okay? So if someone's really, really hurting, if someone lost their family in Omdoy, I'm not going to go up with my Bible and say, Praise the Lord, your family's in Jesus in heaven, if they know Him. That would be so insensitive of me. And I've made mistakes before. I've tried to help people prematurely. But through what I've gone through, I have learned that those who really helped me the most, who knew I was hurting, didn't try to fix me all at once. They just listened. Psalm 46.10 Be still and know I am God. Well, Amen. The most painful part in your life. Maybe words of wisdom helped you. But maybe someone talked too much. What I learned to do is I respectfully said to my friends, Look, I know you're trying to help. You may think you understand. But would you please just stop trying to fix me and just sit here and be with me? Let me cry. Let me be angry. Don't let my pain scare you. If you can't handle my pain, then just go away. Find friends who are not intimidated by suffering. There are the strong ones who understand what it means to be traumatized and to listen. James 2.19 says this, James 2.19, everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak. So let's learn to apply listening skills when we're out with people, especially those who are hurting. Do yourself a test. I try to do this sometimes. When you are out with folks, when you're talking to people, what percentage of the time do you talk and what percentage do you listen? Now, if you talk 90% of the time, that's too much. Learn to listen more. Some of us are more quiet and we listen 90% of the time. That's too much listening. I like to be funny and say, one of the big complaints of wives is that their husbands never talk. A big complaint of husbands is that the wives never stop talking. So we balance each other out, okay? Let's talk, but let's listen, let's listen, and let's talk. Go 50-50, okay? Amen. A great verse that's overlooked. Proverbs 25-20. Whoever sings songs to a heavy heart is like one who takes off a garment on a cold day and like vinegar on soda, rubbing salt in a wound. In other words, if someone is going through a hard time, I need to be sensitive to that and just be there for them. That's a very important principle that we all need to learn. Now let's ask a question. An important question. Think about this. Will you and I, will we suffer with God or without God? The question is not, will we suffer? Every one of us in here, to some extent, has or will experience suffering. I'm talking real suffering, not just not just a bad day or a headache. I'm talking loved ones dying, 
I'm talking real serious issues here. Will you allow God to guide you? Will I allow God to guide me through the suffering? Because as I said, suffering is a tremendous teacher. And going through this with God can help me grow into a person I can never be without suffering. Suffering helps mold us and make us just genuine people. It breaks my heart to see people suffering without Christ because they're hurting and they're not learning from it. There's no advantage. They're just hurting and wasting their time. They're not taking advantage of the suffering. There's no lesson in it. And then they may repeat the same cycle. They don't learn how to get out of the pain. They just stay stuck in it all the time. And that can happen to Christians. We can stay stuck in a pattern of pornography. We can stay stuck in a pattern of unhealthy relationships. A very common situation is a woman, even a Christian woman, will go from one bad man to the next. Why? Probably because their daddy was not there emotionally for them. So they try to earn daddy's love. Their self-esteem was broken. So they drift towards men who are distant, towards bad men, and their whole life they may date and marry and divorce, date, marry and divorce, date, marry and divorce. Unhealthy, ungodly men because their mind is stuck in an unhealthy pattern. They never learn to deal with the deeper issues. Do you have an unhealthy pattern in your life? Have you ever asked yourself, why do you do some things? Some people will work 20 hours a day. Some people will clean their house five times a day. Some people exercise five times a day. We have addictions and compulsions. Why? Those are just the symptoms. What is the deeper root of what God's trying to tell us? Without God, you may stay stuck in this pattern your whole life, even as a Christian. But if you allow Christ to come in and open up these suffering parts and clean them out and heal you and make you whole, He will go there with you and guide you through these painful situations we may be going through. Philippians 3.10 A great verse. I want to know Christ and the fellowship of sharing in His sufferings. I'd like to now begin to close this session with some practical things. What can you and I do? Starting today. To work through the suffering. How can we apply biblical principles through the difficulties of life? You may want to write these down. Here are some practical tips I've learned that I'm still learning. Number one. It is okay to hurt. John 11.35, the smallest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. If our Lord, the Son of God, if God in the flesh gave Himself permission to hurt and to cry, we can too. Us men, we try to be so strong all the time, which is good because we're called to be leaders. But at times, even a soldier needs to sit down and rest. Even a soldier needs help. Even the greatest Christian leaders in history shed some tears. It is okay to hurt. Give yourself permission to feel the pain in your life. Number two, be real. Let's be realistic. Jesus said in Matthew 26, verse 39, My Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but your will be done. He was realistic. 
He realized God may take this circumstance away, but He didn't. God allowed the suffering to come. He was realistic. He faced the cross. Our human nature doesn't want to go to the cross. We want to go around and avoid the crosses of life. But be realistic. If you were abused like me, reality tells us you probably won't heal in just one week. Now God may deliver you. He may heal you like that. I wish He had done that for me. I cried thousands of times, God, why won't you just deliver me? But instead, He took 15 years. And I learned a whole lot more over 15 years of healing than in one second of instant delivery. But He may deliver you like that. But be realistic. If there's serious pain and trauma, the facts tell us it will take time to slowly work through these issues. Number three. I'm sorry, number, uh, number three, be, real, be realistic. Number four. Number four. Settle into the, into the silence. Fighting it may extend suffering. Like going to a dentist. When I was a boy, I was playing uh, like soccer, kickball. And I went to kick the ball and I missed it. And my leg went up, pop, hit me in the mouth and broke off my tooth. So I had half a tooth. My mom took me to the dentist. They put me in the chair and the dentist tried to put shots in my mouth. And I fought him. I hit the dentist. I said, no, that hurts. Leave me alone. I don't want the shots. But my mom came and she said, Scotty, settle down. Relax. The pain is not going to go away if you keep fighting. The more you fight, the worse it gets. The more you struggle, the longer it may take to fix your teeth. Relax. Settle into the pain. And let the dentist fix your broken tooth. Sometimes we want to fight against God when we're broken and ignore the pain. Our fighting and resisting may actually extend the time of healing. Don't fight God. Settle in. Let go. Let go, stop. Let go, my friends. Let Him have the pain and the suffering. Settle into it and begin to learn all you can learn so that you won't have to go through the same suffering a second, a third, or a twentieth time. Once is enough, okay? Learn all we can the first time around. Next point. Let's read Romans 5.3. Would you go back up one? We know that suffering produces perseverance. Great verse. Next point. Very simple. Cry out to God. Let it out. There were times when I would go into my apartment, get alone with God, get on my face, and just let it out. I would talk to God. I would laugh. I would cry. I would scream. I would pound on my bed when I was angry. But I let it out slowly over time. Don't hold it in. Get alone with the Lord. Jesus let it out. He expressed anger and sadness. Be a human being. Don't try to be a robot. Let it out. But let it out in healthy, safe ways. Don't hurt you. Don't punch a wall and break your hand if you're angry. Instead, say, Lord, I'm angry. I'm mad at you. You let somebody hurt me. You let somebody hurt my family. Why? It's okay to let it out and be real and realistic with the Lord. God can handle it. What did Job do? Job 3.16, here's what he said. He's asking a question to God. Why was I not buried like a stillborn child? Like a baby who never lives to see the light. 
In other words, Job was in so much pain, he said, God, why did you even let me be born? Can't I just evaporate? Can't you just make me disappear? I don't want to be on the earth anymore. So if Job, the great man of God, was that honest, I think you and I can apply that lesson. It is okay to be honest. But we don't want to stay stuck there. But we acknowledge we're hurting, accept it, begin to process it, and we move forward. And then here, Psalm 57, 2, I will cry out to God most high. Cry out to Him. Let it out. Number six. Find God in the pain. He's there. He will have many lessons to teach you. So that you then, once you have worked through the suffering, can pass on to others the very healing, the very lessons He gave to you, you pass to others. Now I, when, I'm thankful that my basic healing time is over. From the age of 27 to 42, those 15 years, I could barely function. I could barely do ministry. But God somehow got me through it. Now I'm able to come to you and share with you the years of pain I went through. I pass them to you. And I tell you, you're not alone. God is with you whether you feel it or not. There is something going on in the pain. God's allowed it. He's right there with you. He loves you. It's not an accident this has happened. You are His precious possession. His favorite in the midst of one billion favorites. You're it. He loves you. Find God in the pain. Let it transform you. Let it make you stronger and weaker and more humble and more real than you ever possibly thought you could be. Find God in the pain. Romans 8.28 And here's what happens. We know that God causes some things. What's it say? All things. Even undoing, even abuse, even terrorism, even cancer. All things work for good to those who love God. He's working a masterpiece in you through suffering. Next, pray for God to reveal all things we need to learn. Luke 2.26 It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, reveal to me, what are you trying to teach me? What issue am I running from? He may reveal it quickly, or sometimes in my life, God would reveal it years later. I understand now, much better now, than I did at age 27 when my recovery from the abuse and everything began. I was lost. I was, I was a different person. But now it makes more sense. Okay? Ask God to reveal to you all He wants you to learn. The next thing. Write it out. Get a journal. Write down your thoughts. Write down the ups and the downs. Write out the victories. Write out the sufferings. Put it on paper. Our brain, it, it helps to process things when we write them out. Next, do not isolate. This is important. When we're really hurting, we tend to isolate and withdraw from other people. Now, we need our time alone to pray and to talk and to heal. But don't spend all time alone because that can lead to depression and dangerous thinking. So make it a point if you're going through tough times to schedule regular time with your friends to talk, to go out and exercise, to eat vegetables and take care of your body, drink water, 
That may sound strange, but hear me. When Job was suffering, when you suffer like Job, you lose your appetite. You lose weight. You can't sleep. I lost so many pounds. For weeks and months, I was sleeping two to four hours a night because of the trauma. Yeah, I can't explain it to you. But I couldn't eat. I lost much weight. And I'm, I'm pretty skinny. I don't have much weight to lose. I look like a skeleton. People would always say, Scott, man, you look sick. Are you all right? But I was in recovery. I was suffering and healing. So take care of yourself. And don't isolate. The next point. Again, talk to cr trusted Christian friends. Those who listen. I would get with my friends and I would just cry and yell and say, I'm having all these memories of people abusing me. I remember when my dad left us, how angry I was. I remember those men threatening me with a knife, and I wanted to kill them, but I was afraid if I fought them, I would die. I was laying, letting these things out to my friends, and they were just there for me. Find trusted, confidential friends to talk to about the deepest things in your life. The last point I want to talk about Resolve your will. Decide to let God have His way. In the Bible, when you read the word heart, that word does not refer to the actual physical organ that pumps blood through the body. In the Bible, the word heart consists of three main things. The intellect, the emotion, and the will. You see, through suffering, you won't understand it all. Through suffering, your emotions cannot be trusted because your emotions will be all over the place. What I did, I followed Job's example. He made choices in his will, like in his willpower. Job 13, 15. He didn't understand it. He didn't feel it. But Job made a decision. Job 13, 15. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Amen. That sounds like Jesus. Though he crucified me, I will. Not I think, not I feel, I will trust him. Amen. The will is the part of us that makes decisions. It's your decision-making machine inside of you. You may not feel like going to work on Monday. But you can make a choice in your will to bypass the negative emotion and still go to work. You may not understand all the sufferings in your life. But that's not a justification to, to disobey God. My will... I can choose to override lack of understanding. In my will, I can choose to override no emotions or negative emotions. In my will, I can choose to trust God because He is trustworthy. Trust the Lord. Give it all to Him tonight. If you're hurting tonight, my friend, I want to share one more thing with you. The last point. The best thing about suffering is it does not last forever. Let's look in the Bible now to the final part of Job. Job 42.12 Job 42.12 God restored Job's life. And look at this great verse. The Lord blessed Job in the second half of his life even more than in the beginning. He had more children. He got his business back. He was elevated back to a level of high authority and leadership in the country. But do you think Job was the same person now? Oh no. He was even more of a man of God now than he was before. And the extreme suffering chiseled him and made him a great soldier of love. He became the greatest man of God of his time. 
And it wasn't the blessings only. It wasn't all the abundance from God. God took all that abundance away. It was the suffering that made Job the greatest Christian of his time. So know this. Whatever you're going through, if you really trust Christ from the bottom of your heart with your suffering, it won't last forever. Amen. He will somehow restore you. You will learn from it. You'll be a different person. You'll be a deeper, higher, and wider Christian. Your character and perseverance will be purified and strengthened by the suffering. And even if the suffering ends your life now, then you will go to heaven and there it will all be over forever. I would like to now close the time. Would you please put all your books away? I want to get this personal with every one of us in here. We're going to close the notes, close the computer. I want you to forget about everybody in here except Jesus. Let's take maybe three or four minutes. Everybody just bow your head. Close your eyes. And just you have quality time, silent time with your God. Just you and the Lord now. In a few minutes after we've had quiet time, your pastor will come and give us next direction. So now for a while, let's all just sit in the presence of God.